Hello, welcome to another jam-packed episode of The Racing Room. I'm Andy, and I'm flying solo this week. No Jay with me, unfortunately, but he will be back in the driving seat soon enough. But enough about him, we don't want to talk about Jay. I want to talk about Marilyn Monroe, as I take a deep dive look at the Netflix biopic, Blonde. <laughs> Based on the best-selling novel by Jewish Carol Oates, Blonde is a bold reimagination of the life and times of Hollywood's most enduring icon, Marilyn Monroe. From her volatile childhood as Norma Jean, through her rise to stardom and romantic entanglements, Blonde blurs the line of fact and fiction to explore the widening split between her public and private selves. That is a quick synopsis of the film Blonde. Now, I've not got anyone to ask this question, so I'll ask it of myself. Have I seen this before and what do I remember? Well, yes, I have seen it before, just the once, not long after its release, actually. My memory is, I would say, somewhat limited. I do recall it being quite a hard and heavy film. Lots of emotional scenes, quite a bit of sex in it as well, if uh, memory serves correctly. And I also came away with the feeling that I wasn't entirely sure what was fact and what was fiction. You know, what's true and what's been embellished for effect. But uh, I seem to remember it being quite good at the time of watching it probably 12 months ago 18 months ago something along those lines but anyway let's move on so normally we would talk box office at this point i can tell you that the budget for this film is 22 million dollars but the box office figures are not applicable and that's because for the first time in the rating room we are looking at a film that is a netflix exclusive so technically there's no box office takings of note now, the film itself premiered at the Venice Film Festival on the 8th of September 2022, and it was followed by a screening at the 48th Duval American Film Festival. And it did have a very, very limited theatrical release, but the takings were not recorded or registered because very soon afterwards it did become a Netflix exclusive, as mentioned. So for the first time, we don't have any box office figures to share. Peeling another layer off the onion, the film, as I mentioned, was released in 2022. The director was Andrew Dominic, and the music was by Nick Cave and Warren Ellis. Now, the film itself took quite a few years to get to this point. It was way back in May 2010 that it was announced that Naomi Watts would star in the film as Monroe. However, principal photography didn't take place as planned, with Dominic directing the crime drama Killing Me Softly during this time period. Now, Killing Me Softly was a film that starred Brad Pitt, who subsequently expressed an interest in the project and then became one of the producers for Blonde. Fast forwarding a little bit, moving to April 2014, it was then announced that Jessica Chastain would replace Watts in the title role. But yet again, further delays were in effect because of financing issues. In August 2016, Netflix were announced as the distributors of the film, with Anna de Armas entering the scene in 2019. Anna de Armas would replace Chastain in the role, and there was some criticism at the time, because a Cuban playing the role of Marilyn Monroe was not considered realistic, I guess, at the time. But she was, she was convinced that she could play the role, and so was Andrew Dominic, who secured her the role after just one audition. Now, as mentioned, let's let's talk about some of the stars. So, Anna de Armas stars as Marilyn Monroe. She's appeared in films such as Knock Knock, Blade Runner 2049, and War Dogs. She's probably best known, though, for the role of Nurse Marta Cabrera in the Knives Out film. And, of course, one we've mentioned before here on the pod, and that is No Time to Die, which she played the Bond girl Paloma. Adrian Brody plays the role of Arthur Miller. Most famous for winning the Academy Award for Best Actor for his part in The Pianist. And I believe, this was a record that still stands to this day, he is the youngest actor to win such Oscar. I think he was 29 years old, if memory serves correctly. You might also have seen him in films such as King Kong, The Village, The Grand Budapest Hotel, and Hollywoodland. Bobby Cannavale stars as Joe DiMaggio. Now, my memories of Bobby are on TV shows such as Will and Grace, Blue Bloods, and Boardwalk Empire. But he's also got some films behind him as well, such as Ant-Man and the Wasp, The Irishman, and I, Tonya, just to name a few. Now, 
we're in the midst of award season, hence why we're well, hence why I am looking at the film Blonde, but it's a bit of a mixed bag on the awards front. Anna de Armas was nominated for Best Actress at the Golden Globes, the BAFTAs, the Screen Actors Guild Awards, and even nominated for an Oscar. But the film itself actually won Worst Picture and Worst Screenplay at the Golden Raspberry Awards. Now, let's get into the film proper. Warning in advance, I took a lot of notes. This is a long film, so bear with me as I try and fumble my way through just exactly what happened. But we start with the film in L.A., 1933. Um, There's a birthday surprise for Norma Jean. Her mum takes her to this, uh, looks like an apartment or hotel room, I think it is. I think I think it might be an apartment, actually. Um, she sees a picture on the wall of a man who's told, she's told it's her father. Now, we get the impression at this point she's never met her father. But her mum says this is this is her father in the picture. But her mother's acting quite unhinged. She's seemingly drunk, acting quite crazy in this opening scene. So that kind of sets the tone for what we're about to see. We see the city is on fire soon thereafter. Um, her mother, Norma Jean and her mother are in the car but they're driving towards the fire not away from it they uh, come across a roadblock and the mother says to the police that um, uh, they've got an appointment with someone up in the hills who's got a fireproof room or something along those lines but the policeman just turns her away so back they go we get some disturbing scenes next as uh, you know, Norma's in quite a bit of distress and her mother slams her head into the dash of the car beats her down and then when she's back at the apartment puts her in the bath and tries to drown her so this is kind of really setting the the picture for what childhood was like for Norma Jean back in the 30s she uh, she manages to get out of the bathroom and she runs to the neighbor's house for um, solitude would that be the right word Jay would have the right word but he's not here so I'm just going to leave that one now the uh, the neighbour that she's ran to has said uh, it's time to visit her mother. She, you know, she's been in the hospital for a while. Everything's going to be fine. Only they've tricked her. She's actually off to the orphanage. So you can imagine the uh, the reaction from Norma Jean. She's devastated at this. Um, we don't get any footage from the orphanage because we get a, a time jump into the future. And we see a montage of, of pin-up pictures of, of Marilyn in uh, various outfits and costumes and lack of outfits and costumes I guess in some of the photos that you see and then she's off to meet a I want to say casting director she's she's got a meeting with someone and it's clearly about a part um again we get another quite quite disturbing scene where he basically just forces her onto her hands and knees and then rapes her which and then she comes out of the office there's a secretary sat right outside the office who just kind of avoids eye contact. She knows exactly what's going on in there, so this is something she's probably used to dealing with and uh, just avoids it altogether. Doesn't, it doesn't doesn't sit well. It's, um, it's one of those that doesn't shine Hollywood in a positive light at all. Um, we, we move on to Marilyn at a screen test. Um, now, I thought it was an amazing performance that she gave. It was really quite emotional. But um, she's she doesn't seem happy with it. She asks if she can do it again. And as she's leaving, the, the people who are kind of watching her are saying, you know, that she's not particularly done a great job. And the boss, the only thing he's really got to say as she's leaving is, and I quote, look at the ass on that little girl. So that kind of gives you everything you need to know about the kind of men that were in charge behind the scenes back then. Uh, later on, Norma Jean goes to visit her mother at the mental hospital. Quite an emotional scene. Her mother doesn't recognise her at all. Um, obviously, it's quite it's taking a toll because later we see we see Marilyn back on on set, and she's taking pills between scenes. So this is again another thing that's kind of setting the scene for what's to come. Um, pills are needed to kind of keep her level-headed, as it were. Now we see Marilyn or Norma. Getting friendly with a couple of actors not long there afterwards. Eddie and Cass. Cass being Charlie Chaplin Jr. Um, and then we get a... Well, it's a sex scene, but it's very weird. You know, there's kind of trippy effects going on. And I don't know if they're trying to imply that there's some sort of drug taking been involved. But uh, yeah, very strange sex scene between the three of them. And then the three of them are at the cinema as well. And then um, a little bit more friendliness shall we say 
um, happening in the cinema. Um, very strange dynamic between the three of them. Not long there afterwards, she finds out that she's pregnant. And um, you know, she meets him in the restaurant, tells him the news, and it looks like they're going to be uh, a happy throuple with child on the way. Marilyn's on the phone, talking about an upcoming film. Uh, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, I believe, is the, the picture in question. And they're bringing in Jane Russell for this one. Talk descends into money, as it always does. Turns out that Jane Russell is getting about $100,000 for this, when Marilyn is getting a standard contract of $500 a week. So it works out she's going to get about $5,000. So she's clearly not happy about that. Um, she... Uh, I don't know if she declines the role at this point, but she's certainly she's not agreed to it because of the discrepancy in money. Uh, then we get another visit back to the the mental hospital. So Norma's gone to see her mother again. Um, she's not in a good way, as you might imagine. Things are still very difficult. Um, she speaks with one of the doctors there. Um, she's got some sort of mystery illness. It's not really said what it is, but it's um, it's clearly some some form of mental disorder that she's got. And the worry that Norma now has is that, is this an illness that's going to be inherited? So is, the, is her unborn baby going to suffer from the same thing? So that kind of gets her a mind racing into other things. So she makes the arrangements to have an abortion. Um, we get to the abortion scene, which is, again, another harrowing, difficult scene to watch. She's at the hospital. She starts having second thoughts. She's telling the doctors, no, I don't want to do it. I've changed my mind. But it's too late. No one's listening to her. They they go through with the procedure. There's all kinds of hallucinations where she's she's running through the hospital and then into some flames. And it turns out the flames take her back to the apartment from her childhood. And she opens a drawer because she can hear crying and there's a baby in the drawer. And that harks back to the opening scene where... Her mother was telling her that they were so poor that they couldn't afford a crib for her, so she had to sleep in a drawer. Um, it's a yeah, very, very powerful scene, this. But um, the suggestion here is that uh, Marilyn or Norma had uh, had an abortion. Now, I'm not going to fact check any. I've not fact checked anything. Easy for me to say. Throughout the film, I've just kind of made notes of uh, as I've been watching it. But I have done. A little bit of research in the period since then and there's a lot of discrepancies over what's fact and what's fiction i know that some elements were fictionalized and i think it's been talked about that it is it is in fact a fictionalized version of a true story but um there's there's rumors that marilyn maybe had an abortion or multiple abortions but there's no evidence to back that up so i'm going to try and avoid commenting on what the truth is or isn't as the case may be but uh, that's that's what the film is suggesting at this point is that um that she she didn't want her baby or didn't have her baby because of an abortion we get another time jump not quite as, as big as the early one but it's a fast forward a few months or maybe a year or so and she's at dinner with joe dimaggio they're having a nice conversation there's flash bulbs going off in the background there's obviously the paparazzi are there and uh, she opens up to Joe about some of the pressures of fame and how she really just wants to settle down and have a family. This this is one of those scenes where again it's it's not necessarily powerful in terms of the action uh, or the drama in it but it just gives you a little nugget into the insight of, of what's going on in her mind. You know she just wants to settle down she doesn't want this glitzy glamorous life or at least that's what she says anyway she just wants to be left alone to live a normal life. Um, but we see a uh, on, I don't know if she's on set or she's certainly with some uh, some crew members and they're opening fan mail and one of the letters though is, is confidential and it's a letter from her father um, she's uh, very overwhelmed to receive the letter because she's not been in contact with her father I don't think she's actually met her father ever at this point and then not long after she's on the red carpet for a film premiere and she's told to expect a visit from someone at a hotel room from a um, someone in secret and she assumes it's her dad so you know she's kind of getting a little bit giddy and excited that she's going to finally meet her father after all these years and she rushes back to the hotel room after the the movie premiere and it's not her father it's actually joe joe dimaggio is there and he's got a marriage proposal you know so he's trying to do a nice thing be romantic and stuff but you can sense although she agrees to marry him she can sense you can sense that she's quite disappointed that it um 
it wasn't the daddy she was hoping for, if that uh, makes sense. Cass and Eddie are back on the scene, and they've got uh, some candid photography of Norma, and they try to blackmail Joe. He's not particularly happy about it, and when he gets home, he gives Norma a bit of a slap and uh, tells her that she needs to quit some of the roles that she's taking because she's being... What is she being? What's this, the word I'm looking for? She's she's being overly sexualized, I guess, and he's he's not particularly happy about that. And he's really not happy when we go to a scene not long thereafter where she's filming the infamous scene that uh, everyone knows about. You know, if you know, if you know about films, and that's where the the subway, uh, the air from the subway blows her skirt up as she stood over the grate. And there's there's all kinds of cheering and whooping going on in the background as people watch on. But Joe DiMaggio's in the crowd and he's furious. And uh, when when she gets back to the hotel suite, he's waiting for her, and it turns nasty. Now it goes, they go off camera and you know they're kind of round the corner behind a wall, but you hear the sounds, and she is taking a beating from him. It it's not a pleasant scene at all. Luckily, we don't see it, so it's not visually disturbing. But uh, you know, you get you get the idea of what's going on. What happens as well as you're hearing some of the the sounds of of this beating is that a letter, another letter from a father, has been received, and you hear it being read, and uh, he's basically telling her that he's not going to contact her because he's ashamed of her. Um, so it's. Um, it's a pretty difficult scene to watch and hear. Um, and also it means her marriage is over. Um, so we get another time jump and we move to New York in 1955. And this is where we meet Arthur Miller. He's the playwright. Uh, we see Marilyn on stage about to audition. And he kind of looks around and, you know, Marilyn, right, what am I playing? What's going on sort of thing? And you can tell he's not impressed that she's there. And he says, she's not my Magda. Cut the scene straight to the end of the audition. So you don't actually see the audition. It just goes straight to where she's just finished her audition. Arthur is in floods of tears. He's absolutely blown away by her performance. So he couldn't have been more wrong. And, you know, over the course of the next few scenes, they fall in love. You know, they've had, they have dinner, they fall in love. And she gets pregnant again. Um, so it's looking like, you know, life is starting to turn around for her. And... I get the sense, and again, I don't know the the ins and outs of the actual marriage between the two or the actual um, relationship between the two, but you get the sense that he genuinely does care about her um, and wants to, to treat her well. He doesn't beat her like Joe did or, you know, doesn't take photos of her or trick her into anything like that. He seems like it's a genuine loving relationship. Um, and so you get the sense at this point, that, you know, maybe things are going to be happily ever after. Not quite the case, however. Uh, she miscarries on the beach. She trips. She's carrying a tray of drinks out to the friends on the beach. Trips over. Um, and that unfortunately causes her to miscarry. And we get a kind of a weird cut scene where they come rushing over to see if she's okay. But then it kind of fades into a scene where there's lots of reporters and police. And her on stage singing as part of a film set. Very quickly thereafter, though, she loses it. She, you know, she's... You'd say she's acting like a bit of a diva. But um, she's she's clearly not in the right mental state. She storms off... Uh, not in the right mental state, even. As she storms off the stage. She needs to be injected with something to calm her down. And you just get the sense that she's spiralling. You know, pill taken earlier on. All these tragic things that have happened in her life already. Now she's needing, you know, probably quite heavy medication to... To keep her on the down low, as it were. We get another letter from her dad, which includes the line, Soon I will contact you, I promise. Um, we then, I, I took the note, that at the Some Like It Hot premiere, the scenes were really trippy. Um, it's just a very, a very odd scene. I, I think it's really just there to um, hammer home the fact that she's not in the right state of mind. She's on all kinds of drugs. Um, it's just, things are just not where they need to be for her. Uh, from there, we get another time jump to 1962. 
And uh, Marilyn is on the plane. She's popping some pills to put her to sleep, I think. Um, she then, as the plane lands, she's she's not really in a great state, but she's escorted from the plane, basically frog-marched, because she's going to meet the president. Um, now, you get the sense from this scene that she's not... It's not the first time that they've met. Um, so, she you know, it's, it's not a total surprise to her or anything. But the way it's done is kind of... You know, it's a bit forceful. She's not really, not that she's not complying, but you know, there's there's kind of an expectation um, that she is at his beck and call. It's a very one-sided relationship, and she even says the line to the, I think they assume they're Secret Service guys. Uh, Am I meat to be delivered? Is that what this is? Room service. We then cut to the hotel, see suite as it were, um, in the bedroom. JFK's um, in like vest and underwear on the bed, talking on the phone. I think they're talking. What are they talking? They're talking about some sort of miss. I don't know if I'm going to say they might be talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I could be well off base with that. But it's certainly something quite important from a political point of view. He's not just like chatting to his mates or anything. It is a uh, a genuine conversation that he's having, and he just kind of keeps moving the phone away from his mouth and kind of motioning to a for him for her to uh, pleasure him as it were um and then in this is quite a graphic and disturbing scene he, he basically forces her head down so that she performs fellatio on him and you hear the inner monologue of marilyn um including like you know don't don't throw up you must swallow um it's it's a it's a very difficult scene to watch um and then he he kind of, after she's finished, he kind of forces her back onto the bed and you see the, you know, the scene cuts away and um, she's being woken up. She throws up everywhere and then she's dragged out again by the uh, uh, the security. So, you know, uh, JFK's basically used her, abused her and, and kicked her out. And again, did that actually happen in real life? I'm not sure. I don't know the nature of the relationship between Monroe and Kennedy. There's been various rumours out there, but this basically suggests that JFK forces himself on her in that, uh, and it's shown in, in a pretty, pretty graphic way. Not long thereafter, she's pregnant again, so for the third time, and yet again she's forced to have an abortion. Now again, this this is a very trippy scene. It's almost like you don't know whether it's a dream. You don't know if it's reality. It's quite you know this. Like, is she hallucinating? At one point, she she wakes up and she's covered in blood. Um, it's yeah, a very very bizarre and dark scene, um, as a lot of them are in this. We also we have another letter from her dad, and once again, is that line? Soon I will contact you. I promise. Later on, Norma gets a phone call from Eddie. She uh, she's told that Cass is dead. Obviously, devastating news. Uh, but he's left something for her. We find out what that is when the delivery guy comes and brings it and in the box. And it's a toy tiger inside. Now, earlier on in the film, not long after she'd shared the news of her pregnancy, they were walking through the streets and they found a toy tiger in the street. Um, and obviously he's kept it all these years, put it away for safekeeping for whatever reason. And this is where things take a turn because not only is the toy tiger in the box, but there's also a card. And it simply reads, there never was a tearful father. Love, Cass, with the word love crossed out. And this is what drives her over the edge. You know, she's she's been subject to a vicious prank. You know, her dad was never right into her. It was Cass all along, toying with her emotions. So she starts popping the pills. She's drinking. And she goes to lay down in the bed and overdoses and dies as the scene fades and the film comes to an end. A, well, it's a very difficult film to watch. Very, very emotional. Very graphic. Very dark and disturbing in places. But I have to say, it was excellently performed. A very, very good film. Whether you're a fan of Marilyn Monroe or not, I definitely recommend this, but, um, you know, it's a long film and it is emotionally taxing. That would be my only pre-warning, but 
um, a fantastic, fantastic film. I gave this 8 out of 10. Now, I mentioned some of the award stuff earlier and the kind of the mixed reception it's got, and that plays out in the IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes space as well. So IMDb only gave this film 5.5 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes, even worse. Only 42% on the Tomatometer, with a 36% audience score. Which I'm, uh, I'm a little bit surprised by, to be honest. But, um, yeah, I, I just... I, I thought it was fantastic. I guess the uh, the movie going public didn't agree, though. Now, finally, we'll finish things off with a with a rank bank, as we always do. So let me start with some run times. I mentioned this was a long film. It's actually the second longest one of the mixtape season three so far. At two hours forty six minutes. Only three minutes shorter than Interstellar, which is in number one spot. So the, the second longest of the eight films that I've watched so far. Now obviously box office I mentioned earlier is kind of not applicable, so does that mean it's in eighth place because it's zero dollars? Um, I don't know. I guess it's I guess we'll just have to put call it not applicable. But in terms of budget, twenty two million dollars is the fifth most expensive film of the eight we've seen so far, if my reading comprehension is correct. Let me just double check that. Excuse me, sixth most expensive. So The Whale was $3 million budget. Layer Cake was $6.5 million. Blonde, $22 million. So just below Elf, which was $23 million, and Die Hard, which was $28 million. So a, a, not, a, not a small chunk of change spent on this film. Now, obviously, from, we'll end things on the ratings. No rating from Jay, obviously, is not uh, with me this week. But to, uh, to remind you of his previous two films in the drama and thriller genre, he's got Layer Cake with 8 out of 10 and The Whale with 5 out of 10. Now I gave Layer Cake and The Whale both 7 out of 10, with Layer Cake slightly ahead, but Blonde tops the list for me with an 8 out of 10. Again, a fantastic, fantastic film, albeit one that um, can be quite draining emotionally, um, I would say, but again... Definitely one that I would recommend. And that's your lot for this week. So a shorter than normal episode from what is a, quite a long film, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. Jay will be back very soon. So listen out for some new content coming up in the weeks and months ahead. We are planning to talk about the Oscars in a little bit more detail in this award season. Hopefully we'll do that at some point. We've got Dexter Season 4, which I'm currently about halfway through. Really, really enjoying it. So, uh, really looking forward to recording that section of the podcast. And we've got some more film reviews coming up in the weeks ahead as well. And for those of the who've been long time listeners, you know that I'm a pro wrestling fan. It's WrestleMania season. Never mind the awards season. It's WrestleMania season. So, as I sit here recording, WrestleMania is about five and a half weeks away, coming up in early April. So, what I'm going to try and do over the coming weeks is do some short content, it might just be YouTube exclusive, we'll see how it goes. But looking at some past WrestleMania matches, giving them ratings out of 10 and just giving you a little bit of an overview of what happened. Not necessarily my favourites, what I've done is I've picked some matches at random. Some might be main events, some might be undercard matches, but uh, I've got a selection in mind. So listen out over the coming weeks and um, you'll get my, my views on some WrestleMania history. But in the meantime, thanks for listening. Send any questions, suggestions, feedback to us over email or our social media channels. The rating room at gmail.com is our email address. The rating room.com is our website. And you can find us on all the usual social media sites at The Rating Room, including our YouTube channel. So once again, thanks for listening. And we'll see you soon right here on The Rating Room. <laughs>